Hello everyone and welcome to today's class on the history of China, One Belt, One Road or Boer and China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, also known as CPEC. I hope you are doing well. So I want to start today's class off with just a couple of quick facts on China. So China is the largest populated country in the world. They have a population of about 1.3 billion people. Um, it is the third largest country in the world by area. So it's a very large country. Um, its currency is the Yuan and it has the third largest military in the world. Right at the top uh, is um, in terms of military, um, the US has the biggest military, then Russia, and then China. Um, the language spoken in China is Mandarin. All right, um, next I want to talk to you a little bit about religion and culture in uh, China. And this I will follow up with a conversation on their value system. So um, in China, um, generally speaking, there's a lot of um, people who are, um, you know, unaffiliated with religion, so uh, pretty much secular. Um, so if you look at, you know, this, this chart over here, um, this red, which is, you know, about 73% of the population, actually is something like 74%. These are unaffiliated to any religion. Um, the yellow represents Buddhism. Um, the green represents, you know, other religions and um, blue represents Christianity. So, um, and the green, which is like really the sliver over here, this really small um, section that is 0.45% uh, and that's Islam. So, um, you know, in terms of religion, uh, the country, though it is uh, secular, they, their value system is deeply entrenched in Confucianism, Taoism and Buddhism. And uh, these are pretty much the three teachings that have sh historically shaped Chinese culture. Some of the national characteristics that China have is number one, they are um, extremely hardworking uh, people and they're also known to be very, very nationalistic. Um, I think it's very important to um, talk a little bit about Confucius. Um, because a lot of their value system in China is based on Confucians. Um, and so he, uh, Confucius basically believed in something known as secular mo morality. Um, he taught three uh, main principles. And uh, these main principles were, uh, number one, human kindness. Uh, number two, etiquette or being very polite. And number three, respect for um, elder people. Um, so he basically um, entrenched these three uh, main uh, concepts. Um, he taught, according to Confucius, that a superior person is a person who loves learning for the sake of learning and who is a good person for the sake of being a good person. Another word for good person is righteous. So he's righteous for the sake of being righteous. And um, he basically felt that there were, you know, the important values um, that he inculcated were sincerity and the cultivation of knowledge. And um, he felt that lead by virtue, not by punishment. And he put a lot of emphasis on truth and honesty. Um, and his, one of his golden rules was, do not do to others what you would not want done to yourself. Um, and um, some people during the Cultural Revolution, which I'll talk about a little bit later on in this lecture, some people in the Communist Party during the Cultural Revolution um, felt that, you know, some of these concepts stopped them from, um, you know, modernizing at a very fast pace. But uh, by and large, Confucius, um, you know, his, his sayings are just remarkable and um, his knowledge and his wisdom and his value systems is what kind of, um, you know, gave the shape to the, the basic culture and the norms and the values of China as we know it today. Um, two other people um, that had a huge influence on China was, uh, you know, uh, 
the religions were Taoism, and uh, this was led by a Lao Tzu, and uh, this Taoism basically advocated humility and religious piety. And um, then there was also Buddha, um, who, you know, the religion is known as Buddhism. And again, um, Buddhism is really a religion that believes in mindfulness and um, really living, you know, a gentle, living very gently and, um, you know, with good intentions. And, um, you know, so that's basically, these are the, the, the three main religions that, um, have basically gave, um, you know, you would, you would almost call it, they're the soul of China and they gave, um, you know, all the values that Chinese people have really stem from these three um, religions. All right, next I'm going to start talking to you a little bit about China's history. And it's a very remarkable story, a story that, you know, I personally, you know, when I hear, read about China's history and I learned about it, um, uh, you know, before I knew it. And once, I, as soon as I, sorry, as, as soon as I got to know it, I was really taken aback and it took me by shock. Um, I think that, you know, if I had to comment on the history of China, I think it's just a remarkable story. It's a story of resilience. It's a story of strength and it's a story of victory. Um, but embedded in this story is also a lot of pain and difficulty, um, but what is inspiring is the way uh, China as a country recovered from the pain and from the difficulties that it faced. And today it's become one of the world's leaders and um, there's absolutely no denying that. So that being said, I want to start sharing the story of China's history with you. All right, so I'm going to start all the way back um, in the 1700s. And at that time, there were some dynasties. And here you can see, you know, dynasties is basically, you know, kings and queens. And uh, you can see these are, you know, beautifully uh, adorned and dressed uh, kings and queens. And at that time, uh, China was known as the Imperial China. And some of the famous dynasties, um, you know, at that time, you know, that are known are the Shang dynasty and the Zhao dynasty. Um, in 201 to 206 BC, uh, which is really long time ago, um, the first Qin emperor united China. And he was the first Qin emperor, was a very famous gentleman. And he was the one who started, um, you know, the whole Great Wall of China construction. And it was, you know, after his death, China went into a phase of a little bit of um, instability. But following, um, you know, the first Qin Emperor, uh, the Han Dynasty came into power um, between 206 and 589 BC. And this, when during the Han Dynasty, this was known as Chinese China's Golden Age. And there was a lot of growth in the economy. There was promotion of Confucianism as its state philosophy. Um, during this time, Buddhism also made inroads into China. And, um, you know, after Han, for four after this dynasty, for four centuries, there was a lot of competition between um, other dynasties within China. Um, in the period of 618 to 1279 BC, the Tang and the Song dynasties made a high point in the Chinese civilization. And in China, there was a flowering of literature, scientific innovation. Um, there was a lot of philosophy, moral, ethical, meta, metaphysical Chinese philosophy that was highly influenced by Confucianism. And, um, you know, there was, uh, there was just a lot of, um, you know, uh, culturally it was blooming. China was absolutely blooming. Um, this is, you know, a very interesting photograph I wanted to um, share with you, the one on the right over here. Um, and this one was, you know, um, this is an actual, um, you know, these are about 700,000 people worked to make these uh, monuments. And here you can actually see that this was discovered in 1974 in Xi'an. And um, these were all made, um, you know, um, for, um, depicting the Qin Shing Huang, the first emperor of China. 
um, that I had mentioned a couple slides ago. And uh, the whole idea, you know, was that, you know, even um, that these armies would protect the emperor in his afterlife. So um, as you can tell, you know, he was a very uh, beloved um, emperor. Um, and um, so um, this is just a representation. It's, a, it's known to be a very famous historical site in China. All right. So, you know, all of these M dynasties were doing very well. And, you know, um, as I mentioned, China was prospering. But then what happened was that in 1271 to 1368, what happened was that the Mo Mughals, um, Mongols, uh, sorry, came and they were led by Kublai Khan. And so um, Kublai Khan who was the grandson of Genghis Khan, conquered China. And they were the, uh, it was Kublai Khan who first established the currency of the Yuan. And uh, during his time, um, he decided that Beijing would be the capital of China. Um, then, you know, in 1368, the Mongols were um, overthrown by the Ming Dynasty. And um, it was during this time that, you know, the Great Wall of China was actually completed. In 1644, the Manchu Zing dynasty drove out the Ming dynasty and China reached its zenith. And at this time in 1644, it invaded Tibet, Mongolia and Xinjiang, also known as um, Turkestan. In the 19th century though, um, you know, Western powers started uh, creating trouble. And um, it was during the, the King, uh, Qing, uh, sorry, dynasty that um, there were a lot of problems and the Western forces started uh, coming in through the um, British East India Tea Company and they started creating all these treaties and China started facing some very difficult times. Um, this is a photo of uh, the Great Wall of China. And again, this was, you know, built by these uh, dynasties right and the Ming dynasty completed it but you can just see that you know even today these are known as this is known as one of the big wonders of the world and if you can see from this photo just the length and the diff just imagine the difficulty of building this you know on all of these mountains and um, you know it was constructed so beautifully and so well that even today it is uh, you know in excellent shape and, and is continues to be known as one of the wonders of the world so, um, you know, I just want to uh, just give a quick synopsis, stop here and give a quick synopsis um, so far. So, so far in China, um, times were good. Um, absolutely, there were some changes in dynasties. There were some difficulties and um, problems within the dynasties, but by and large, China was doing extremely, extremely well. And um, they really uh, were, you know, they had everything they needed. Um, they had all kinds of resources, um, you know, culturally they were doing well, um, scientifically they were doing well, everything was going extremely well. But it was at this time, again, during the Qing uh, uh, dynasty that, you know, the downfall of China and a very painful part of their history began. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the Opium War and the century of humiliation. So um, again, um, for me, the first time I heard about the Opium Wars, I was really shocked and it really um, startled me that any country could go through um, such a painful um, history. But um, it's something that I think we can all learn from. And I really hope that um, such a gruesome history is never repeated in any country in the world. I don't think any country deserves this. Um, but anyways, um, let me take you back in time. And so, um, as I was just saying, the dynasties were doing by and large quite well. Um, you know, you, these, all this architecture was built, everything was going well. But um, what happened is, you know, in 1839 to 1842, um, the Opium Wars began. And basically, again, as I mentioned, China at this time was self-sustaining. It had no need for any European products. But what happened is the East India Company started making inroads in China and in India. And uh, Britain basically had its eye on a lot of Chinese goods such as porcelain, silk, tea, 
you know, and all these wonderful things that were being made in China. Um, to date, you know, Chinese silk is known to be one of the best in the world. Um, Chinese tea is also known to be, um, you know, superb. So anyways, you know, um, the East India Company sort of had, it, uh, had its eye on all of these wonderful things in China. And they were, you know, wondering how they should trade because honestly, the Chinese really didn't need anything that the British had to offer them. So what um, the British um, East India Tea Company started doing was that they started growing opium um, in China, in India, sorry. So they started, British East India Company started growing a lot of opium in um, India, which um, nowadays, if you refine this drug, uh, opium, it's known as heroin. And so they started taking this um, and selling it in China. And they asked for silver in return. Now, um, immediately when this started happening, a lot of drug addiction started spreading in China. And there were huge outflows of silver. Now, the government realized that this was a very dangerous situation because, you know, all of their workers um, were pretty much drugged. I mean, the whole country slowly and steadily um, started getting addicted to um, opium and uh, this was a very big problem and many times the government tried to pass uh, treaties to you know making um, this drug uh, sale illegal but um, the British would smuggle this in um, through various means and um, one of the you know one of the kings at this time also wrote to the queen in in england saying that you know this um this drugs uh, that were being sold and smuggled in china were really destroying their country and that it should be stopped but even that communication was completely ignored um and so at one point the government confiscated 2.6 million pounds of opium and food in the ocean but instead of you know, um, stopping. The British got very angry and they attacked China and they won. And at this time, they signed uh, this a treaty called of Nanjing. And according to which, uh, in this treaty, um, Hong, they would take over Hong Kong as a British colony. And five ports were made British. Uh, you you know were made so that British could trade anything they wanted on these five ports. And so, you know, this basically started a century of humiliation for China. Um, and um, this, this whole, you can see in this particular uh, photo, you know, these British armed forces actually just, you know, um, forcing these, you know, Chinese people to, and it's very symbolic to just sort of get, have a lot of opium. And, you know, you can see that they've just been, they're just smuggling in opium over and over. So, you know, obviously the government realized that this was a very bad situation and that should be stopped. Um, and so, you know, they had, they did try to, you know, uh, fight back in the first opium war, they, they failed. Um, but what happened is that Britain um, started realizing that they wanted even more concessions and unrestricted uh, trade at any port. So they weren't happy with just you know, a few ports, they wanted access to all the ports and um, and uh, they wanted to ban, uh, uh, end the ban on opium in China. So they just wanted to just go in and spread, you know, opium all over. And um, what they did was they registered uh, the ships of Chinese traders as um, British ships. So a lot of the ships they registered. Um, okay, so what happened in 1856, uh, was that um, that caused the second opium war was something very bizarre, a very bizarre event. Um, so what happened is that Chinese authorities seized a pirate ship and um, it had an expired British um, registration. So its papers were all expired. And um, what happened is that the captain of that ship um, basically went and told the British authorities that you know, once the Chinese had taken over this pirate ship, they had taken down the British flag. And um, so the British said that, you know what, um, on this pirate uh, ship, release uh, all the prisoners. And there were 14 prisoners on this ship. 
And um, when the Chinese just released nine out of the 14, the British got very angry and they just, you know, attacked. And um, it was a very unfortunate time because within China, there was some um, civil war, kind of a civil situation going on because there was a, you know, farmers uprising. And because of the farmers uprising, um, and also, of, of course, you know, there was a lot of uh, people drugged and not in good shape. So unfortunately, China lost the second um, opium war as well. And the British captured many forts. And um, Russia also ended up taking a part of China. And um, even today, that, that's part of Russia. And it's called uh, Vlad, Vladivostok. Um, Ten more cities were... Um, designed as treaty uh, ports and uh, basically the British said that you know they wanted 10 more ports um, to have access to the whole Yangtze uh, River and mainland China and um, basically they said that China, Russia, France and England would open their embassy within uh, China and now because they had China lost the second opium war they had no choice but to allow all of this to happen it was during this time that um, opium was legalized in China, again, um, because of all of this, you know, they, they had lost the uh, second uh, opium war and with all of the British um, influence, they, they legalized opium and um, also they brought in, you know, Christianity in a big way. It was during this time that British actually took a lot of Chinese as laborers to the US and they fined China 8 million silver dollars in indemnities just in fines. So 8 million silver dollars, which was a lot of money. It was during this time uh, because of all of this drug addiction that uh, China fell, fell behind economically, politically, and military, militarily. Um, and um, it was also during this time that you know, China was humiliated by greedy and technologically superior Westerners. So um, in terms of, you know, military, you know, the British were far ahead. And so, um, you know, they had the guns, they had um, other, you know, technological advanced um, equipment, and this really bothered the Chinese. And basically something that all Chinese people, um, you know, decided were, was that every government after this era um, started with, you know, they, they believed um, in the self-strengthening movement. And uh, their basic goal was to make sure that they catch up with the West and that they um, especially become strong economically, politically, and militarily, and that this situation that they went through never ever repeats itself. And um, that, you know, they never fall behind in these three areas, economically, politically, and militarily. Japan, you know, learned a lot from observing what happened in China. And they, you know, really worked very much to um, become technologically advanced. Now, um, unfortunately, this, this period of humiliation continued. And in 1899 to 1901, there was a Boxer Rebellion in Northern China. And this Boxer Rebellion um, aimed to drive out foreigners and reestablish traditional rule. Um, again, uh, you know, unfortunately, they lost and they were defeated by Western powers such as Russia, US, Japan. Italy, France, and Britain, and they extracted even more concessions, and they looted the country for one more whole year. Now, um, thankfully, all of this really sad period came to an end in, in 1911. Unfortunately, it was, you know, a very long period. It was almost 100 years, and therefore, it's known as the century of humiliation. Um, finally, though, in 1911, uh, China, emer you know, there were military revolts and um, this finished the Qing dynasty. And it was during the Qing dynasty that there were all of these, you know, Western uh, powers that had sort of infiltrated the country. So this dynasty finally came to an end. And um, it was during this time that it was Sun Yat-sen, this gentleman right here on the right hand side, he's known as the father of the nation. And he is the one who kind of ended all of this dynasty and he began the process of consolidation of China. 
and um, it was also during his the, his this period of time that the communist party emerged and um, then in 1925 uh, after the death of sun yat sen um, another gentleman came into power known as um, chan kai uh, shek and um, he became the leader of the nationalist um, so he didn't come into power but this gentleman actually just became uh, came um, became a prominent leader of the democratic or nationalist party um and uh, then in 1931 to 1945 you know japan invaded and occupied more and more of china um and in 1934 mao zedong emerged as the communist party leader so as you can see what's going on over here there's still people attacking china from outside but china started getting its act together within itself and um, you know, um, there two parties emerged, the Communist Party and um, led by Mao Zedong, and then there was the Nationalist Party, the Democratic Party. And, you know, these are the two um, symbols, right? Of, of So this is the Communist Party and this was the Democratic Party. And um, they basically, what happened is that both of these parties united together in 1937 to um, drive out um, Japan and uh, this was a civil war uh, within the country to drive out Japan from the country. So um, it took 20 years uh, of civil war um, against the Nationalist Party. Um, and so, you know, finally, yes, they made some traction. Um, they, they definitely drove out the, the Japanese. But what also happened was that there was a, a rift between the Nationalist Party and the Communist Party. And um, obviously, the ideologies were very different. Eventually, what happened is that this rift lasted 20 years between these two parties. And eventually, the nationalists or the Democrats, they were asked, they were basically, they had to retreat to Taiwan. And um, so they were asked to pretty much leave China. You know, they were, um, um, it, they went into exile in a way. And so they went all the way to Taiwan and set up a whole separate government over there. In 1950, China sent an army to um, Tibet and they had a claim over Tibet. And so basically, um, they basically wanted to just say that, look, I mean, Tibet is part of China and they wanted to reinforce the, enforce this. In 1953, under, under Mao Zedong, um, there was a very big movement in China known as the Great Leap Forward. And this basically aimed to transform the country from agrarian, meaning a farmer, farmer of a country that was focused for primarily on agriculture, to one that was a socialist. And they basically, the whole idea was in this great, great leap forward, um, they wanted to have rapid industrialization and, uh, and you know, use collectivism or communism. And uh, they made huge industrial investments and their focus was on two things, um, making steel and increasing um, the grain or basically the output of agriculture. And unfortunately though, there were some major disruptions while making this, you know, um, improving this, this whole farmer and agriculture um, set up. And so unfortunately there was a great Chinese famine and 18 million people died during this Chinese famine. Um, but, you know, subsequently there were some agricultural reforms that were set up, rural taxes were um, implemented. And it was, you know, it was during Mao Zedong. So, you know, China at this time in history, if you really look at it, they had gotten out of all of these difficulties, a century of humiliation. Um, finally, you know, the, the Communist Party was in power and they were in a rush. They were in a rush to sort of uh, make a big progress. Now, when they were making this huge progress and they were, you know, they basically were making all these investments, um, they, they were also pretty, you know, they, they were a bit harsh on the people as well because they were focusing on, you know, um, quickly sort of advancing. And so this, this whole idea of um, communism was really, really enforced. 
and there were a lot of communes that were set up, which is big groups of people living in huge, huge houses. And um, it was almost like, you know, working day and night. Um, and even, you know, in the backyard of every house, there were steel furnaces that were set up. And, um, you know, what happened is that when the famine came, uh, because of their history and because of their, you know, all the difficulty they had faced, they refused to take any international help. And I think what happens is, you know, whether it's a human being or a country, once you've been, um, you know, uh, your, your trust has been um, misused or uh, you've been let down in a big way, it's very hard to trust again. So they really didn't do that. Um, and they projected that they would give um, the state more than they were actually able to produce. So they kept promising people that, look, we'll give you more food and this and that. But there was a problem. I mean, they really, there was a very big problem and, and there just wasn't enough food. And so um, th this famine, unfortunately, happened and it took a toll on the country. But uh, their resolve to progress was um, stronger than even this huge setback. They made a lot of attempts to educate rural people in villages. Uh, the government wanted to take control of agriculture. Um, rural taxes were implemented. Millions of people started working for the steel industry. And, you know, it was during this time that there were several vi villages saw, you know, rebellions. And these rebellions were, were pretty big rebellions. But again, um, the country continued to move forward. Um, in 1949, uh, the Chinese flag was first flown. And um, here you can see this red is like the revolution and the blood of all those who died during the Civil War um, and the Japanese invasion. So again, this symbolizes, you know, all the blood that was, um, you know, that flowed, um, you know, at the time when the J Japanese were being, you know, ousted from the country. Um, there are, you know, all these these stars. They have they each star has a representation. The four small stars represent the model of society, influenced by Confucius, and each of these stars represent their four. They represent the gentry or the ruling class, the farmers, the artisans, and the merchants. And um, and this uh, large star represents unity. And um, again, this was, you know, the Mao Zedong time, and this was, you know, all the um, steel furnaces. So um, there were commune members that were working at night using lamps, you know. Um, and um, in the beginning, the commune members were able to eat free in the commune can canteens, but unfortunately, this changed once the famine came. And, you know, um, as I mentioned, that was very unfortunate that a lot of people lost their lives. Um, in 1959, uh, there were Chinese uh, forces had to um, suppress a, a revolution kind of a, or a revolt in Tibet. And so um, if you recall, you know, Tibet had been taken over by one of the dynasties for way back when, but um, as they, you know, and, and um, they seem there, there were some problems. So in 1962, what happened is that there was a brief conflict between uh, China and India over a Himalayan uh, border. Now, it was also at this time that um, a, a Sino or a Chinese Indian border conflict happened. And basically, this was, uh, you know, after the whole, you know, Tibet conflict that had happened, the revolt in Tibet, um, India gave, gave refuge to Dalai Lama, who was, you know, from in Tibet. And um, this, the, so basically, there, there, a war kind of started on the border regions between um, India and China. And um, the border regions had roads that connected China to Tibet. And China got this, you know, initially China had a very good feeling towards India. And um, they really felt very sympathetic towards India because they felt that, you know, um, the same British India company that had, um, you know, done a lot of damage to China, had also taken over India, and that they had um, caused a lot of problem in India. But um, over a period of time, you know, and during Nehru's time, they kind of realized that um, India actually was the, very close to the British Empire, and um, that they also felt that India was causing conflict in Tibet. 
and that India wanted to colonize Tibet. And so, um, you know, this small war kind of on the border, this conflict did happen. And it ended with the Chinese winning um, in the war. And um, this caused also a lot of problems um, between the relationship of China and India all the way, um, you know, till 1993. For, so for about 30 years, um, there was a lot of mistrust between the two countries. And again, it was all stemming from Tibet. All right, now, um, Coming back, you know, after this little um, event of this conflict with India, um, a lot was going on within the country as well. So after that, you know, in 1966, all the way to 1976, um, Mao Zedong started the Cultural Revolution. And um, this was basically an ideological and political campaign against the elites of China. Um, and so he basically asked all these, you know, young people, and you can see, you know, several young people in these photos. These are all photos from the Cultural Revolution. He basically said um, that they should uh, join something called the Red Guards, uh, it, you know, a group of people that were mobilized against any inequality, corruption, and inflation um, in the country. And so they were asked to kind of fight the elites and fight all of any inequality or corruption that they saw. And um, they also said that anyone who had ties with the West or the nationalist slash democratic party should be killed. Now, unfortunately, these young people um, from known as the Red Guard, they went out of control. And some um, uh, basically youth were sent to the villages to disperse the Red Guard. And it was during this period of time that it was a very difficult time in China. One to eight million people were killed. And it was also during this time in 1976, Mao died and his wife and three of his close allies, the Gang of Four, were arrested. So this brought an end to the, you know, the to Mao Zedong's um, era. And um, following Mao Zedong, I mean, he did... Uh, he, his intentions seemed to be very good for China, um, and you know definitely they did see some progress. But my one of my favorite people in Chinese uh, in China's history is <coughs> Deng Zi, Zi Ping, Xiaoping, and so he was um, the next. Uh, you know he he took over uh, power after Mao Zedong. So um, Deng was a gentleman that um, he brought in a period of economic reform and an industrial revolution. So um, he is, you know, I think contributed to uh, China in a huge way. So, <clears throat> so um, after Mao Zedong, he first of all allowed people to criticize the Cultural Revolution and realized that it perhaps wasn't the best thing for the country. And the first thing, you know, Deng brought in um, several, he, if you really think about it, he was, uh, you know, known for six major things that he contributed. The first thing that um, Deng contributed was that he basically learned um, a diplomacy and he believed in learning from, and he believed, sorry, in diplomacy and learning from others. And um, so Deng was very impressed with Singapore's economic development, its greenery, its housing. <clears throat> and so he sent tens of thousands of Japanese to Singapore and to other developed countries around the world to learn from their experience and bring back their knowledge. And uh, another thing is that, you know, his, some of his close advisors told him that this whole communist ideology is not going to work um, from a diplomatic point of view. And so um, China basically, um, you know, understood that. And so they kind of shifted more towards a communist socialist ideology. And um, it was during this period of Deng that China improved its relationships with the US and Japan. Um, and he also negotiated with the United uh, Kingdom that Hong Kong should be returned to China because as you recall, 
you know, um, Hong Kong was taken over during the first opium war by the UK. Um, Deng also set up an anti-crime drive and um, he basically continued with this, you know, idea of one child policy because he felt that the population was growing very rapidly and um, the population had reached one billion people. So he felt that the one child policy would be good for the country. He was known for the modernization of agriculture, industry, science, technology, and the military. And again, as I just mentioned, he aimed at making China, instead of a communist country, more of a socialist market economy. So um, kind of, um, instead of communism, he decided to move towards socialism with Chinese characteristics. And um, he introduced a lot of economic reforms in the country. Um, another couple of um, interesting things that um, Deng did was that he led a lot of export-led growth. He didn't dictate uh, people. He basically told the local provinces that they were allowed to make investments in industry and they could choose whatever industry they wanted to invest in, but that they should move towards, um, you know, manufacturing. And so the, a lot of the um, provinces decided to invest in lighting. So, um, and the reason was this was low capital was required for, to, um, you know, manufacture lighting and you could export a lighting and earn a lot of money. And so um, they started generating profits from lighting. <clears throat> and this, these profits were then reinvested in more technologically advanced industries. None of the investments were government mandated. So again, people were allowed to choose where they wanted to make the investments. Secondly, another thing that Deng believed in was that he encouraged foreign investment and um, he wasn't scared. He, you know, though he was, you know, they were all still very nationalistic, but he um, felt that foreign investment was important. And he set up some um, special economic zones and um, he therefore was able to get a lot of foreign funds invested in the country. And, um, you know, when foreign, um, foreigners invested in, let's say, making factories, they also brought with them advanced technology and management expertise. And so labor productivity increased and, you know, people learned a lot of new skills at this time. He also set up good policies and markets for the rural population and the farmers. And as a, as a result, there was an increase in the agricultural output. Now, with all of these wonderful things happening during Deng's era, unfortunately, there was jealousy on the uprise again um, around the world. In 1989, what happened is that, um, you know, in the government of Deng, there was a gentleman by the name of um, Hugh Yaobang. And this gentleman was a proponent of capitalism and the free market. And so a lot of people under Deng, not um, him specifically, but um, uh, some of the senior party members at that time, you know, really were not a big fan of um, Hugh. And so when he died um, in 1989, there were a lot of protests that started. And these protests were being led by students. And these students basically said that they felt that um, you know, people were not fair with Q uh, Yaobang and um, they had, uh, you know, people in the government were, you know, were biased, there was nepotism. And so they had all of these, um, you know, pro issues with the government. And all of a sudden, you know, the world was taken by shock because, you know, the, this gentleman's death um, started off as, you know, a political, uh, you know, person who had died, but they were started, you know, these students started demonstrating and the students demonstration increased to 100,000 students demonstrating. And, um, you know, it just, you know, all the world media was, you know, focused on this. And um, then, you know, in order to finish these demonstration, demonstrations, 200,000 you know, military personnel were sent in and unfortunately, 200 students died during this time. Now, um, you know, when 
China started taking a closer look at what had happened, it, Deng basically felt that the United States had been too deeply involved. And this, um, this student, um, and they were perhaps behind, um, you know, the student movement. And um, so they basically also um, referred to a lot of foreign reporters who had given financial aid to student leaders. So again, um, it seemed that there was some funding um, that was done by the United States of this whole, um, these protests. And what happened is a lot of these students that had protests later on, um, they were allowed to escape to various uh, Western countries, primarily um, the United States to Hong Kong and Taiwan. So again, you know, Deng felt that, you know, this was a lot of outside intervention that caused this internal problems. And um, it was very clear that um, if this had allowed to grow bigger, that this would have led, had led to a whole civil war. And so um, basically at this time, um, the whole um, party, the communist uh, party um, under Deng's leadership decided that they wanted to get rid of all of these, you know, liberals who basically were very big proponents of capitalism and the free market. Now, once they said all of this out loud and they started taking action. The Western uh, media really cracked down on China and um, this led to a lot of um, sanctions being put against China. Um, also during this period of time, uh, both China and Russia were basically looking, um, they were in the race for world domination. But it was after the fall of Russia in 1991 that the relationship of both of these nations started improving. And today they have very strong alliances with each other. All right, so um, after this unfortunate epi episode of the Tiananmen Square, and again, the Tiananmen, it was known as the Tiananmen Square because it was the Tiananmen Square where all of these students got together to do the protest. But after that very unfortunate event, um, you know, in 1993, Jiang Zemin uh, took over as the president and he started working on, you know, uh, making a huge dam um, for uh, water. And so here it was, it's known as the Three Gorges Dam and it's just, you know, it's huge. It's huge and obviously the water requirement for China was a lot. And again, it's through this, uh, through dams um, and, you know, energy can also be generated. And so um, in this, this dam, the construction started in 1993. It continued all the way to 2009. Um, during uh, uh, Ziang, uh, sorry, Jiang Zemin's period, China and Russia's um, relationships really restored and China fixed its first floating rate. And um, also it's got into, you know, uh, they made, there was a treaty by the name of Ch Shanghai Five. So Russia, China, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, they all joined together. Um, also during this period of time, Hong Kong reverted back to Chinese control. And um, there was a lot of crackdown on corruption. And, um, you know, there was also some military exercises that were done to simulate the in invasion of Taiwan. So Taiwan was, uh, continues to be a bit of a sore spot because, you know, the nationalists had, had gone, um, you know, from China there. So again, um, you know, Ch Chinese keep a strong uh, eye on Taiwan. In 2001, after a lot of preparation, China just decided to sign the World Trade Organization and um, through that lower its tariffs and enter the whole uh, globalization era. Um, now, um, after um, Mr. Uh, Jiang, uh, Jiang uh, Zimen, um, Hu Jintao took over as the head of the Communist Party and um, they basically had a new policy on Taiwan if they, which was that if they declare in, in uh, independence, then force would be used against them. And um, unfortunately, it was during this time that relationships with um, Japan started to deteriorate. Um, one thing that interesting thing that happened was that um, during this early 2000s, 
China entered space, which was a very big um, step for China uh, because all big uh, superpowers in the world, um, you know, have been, were entering space. Um, and so China and Russia, because their relationship was improving, they started holding joint military exercises. Also, China began um, signing deals with um, in Africa, and they signed a two billion deal in Africa. Pollution became a big issue because all of a sudden, a lot of manufacturing started shifting from around the world to China because um, you know the labor rate was low. Um, the factories that were being made in China were very good factories, and um, there were special economic zones. And also the taxes was another very big reason that there were a lot of factories that were being built in China. Um, so a lot of the manufacturing almost, it was became, started becoming known as the factory of the world. And I'll talk to you a little bit about the um, taxes a couple slides down. Um, also um, in 2009, Russia signed a deal with China to supply it with oil for 20 years in exchange for loans. Um, it was during this period of time that the one child policy was relaxed and um, also by 2010, China became the biggest exporter of goods in the world. Again, this was a result of the increase in manufacturing in China. In 2010, uh, the US um, accused China of cyber attacks and um, this became a little bit of an issue between both of the countries. and. Um, so a lot of the tension between China and Japan was around the South Sea China. And I will talk to you a little bit about that as well, a couple slides down. So one of the reasons that um, helped China become the global factory of the world was its economic policies. So um, if we look at it, um, you know, China, first of all, um, started this whole value added taxation. And this basically means that the amount of um, value add only, so let's say there was a good uh, that's, that started off as 100, um, worth 100, right? Um, but then all of a sudden, um, the, a lot of value was added to the good. It was manufactured and it was um, transformed. So the value from 100 uh, became 300. So the total tax that was charged was in China would only be um, on 200. So um, 300 was the final price of the manufactured good, 100 was the original value. So the increase of 200, the value addition, that's all that was taxed in China. Whereas in all other countries, the full 300 value would be, would be um, taxed. So this um, you know, led to a huge difference in the taxation. So if you look at the taxation of the US versus China, um, goods that were being taxed 35% in the US would only be charged 2% um, in China. And so this is basically on the product of iPhone, right? So the iPhone, um, if it were made in the US, it would be charged 35%, but in the, in, when it's manufactured in China, it's, the taxation is only 2%. So this basically helped, you know, decrease the total cost of goods in, that were being manufactured in China. Also because China had a huge trade surplus, they were becoming, you know, they had become the biggest exporters in the world. Um, they decided to devalue their currency and they were able to do it because they were economically very strong. And because they devalued their currency, um, that made Chinese things cheaper in international markets. They also had economic free zones and, um, you know, and these economic free zones, um, a lot of people that have, had invested, foreign investors were getting all types of tax breaks and, um, you know, uh, lots of different benefits. There were some criticisms um, to manufacturing in China, such as intellectual property rights. So if there was a design that was sent to a Chinese factory, Sometimes it was leaked out. Um, that was one of the big um, criticisms. Um, there, some people initially said that there was inconsistent quality, even though very over very uh, short period of time, China improved its quality. And today, um, very few people have objections over Chinese quality as compared to the past. Um, 
and you know the devaluation of currency um, though it made everything uh, that was made in China cheaper um, it, it did have some uh, negative repercussions as well so um, you know again this was a very big uh, shift in China however China also had um, little, some um, challenges that it had to deal with and one of its challenges was that at one time it had a lot of oil but it had run out of oil and um, in 2002 China had an energy crisis and China basically depends 70% of its total energy um, comes from coal and 80% of its total electricity comes from coal now um, what happened in 2002 because of this energy crisis was that all of a sudden the country ran out of electricity and there were blackouts all over the country and um, you know they tried making a new grid system but still there were problems and the country and the country really really realized that this is something uh, dangerous um so you know and with all of the manufacturing china's oil demand in 2004 didn't grow by just seven to eight percent, which what which is what they had anticipated. In fact, it grew by sixteen percent, and so all of a sudden, you know, they um, had to in, in, increase the amount of uh, petrol they were importing um, substantially. So now that they were faced with this very big um, energy crisis, uh, they and they had a lot of new energy requirements. They started moving um, towards Africa. Uh, because Africa, as you know, um, has a lot of oil-rich um, places such as Nigeria and all. So they started making, um, you know, a lot of deals in um, Africa. And there were a lot of people who were against this because they said that, you know, perhaps China is trying to colonize Africa. But um, actually, Chinese basically said that they were doing a lot to help um, the African commodity exports, they were actually doing a lot to help Africa's African markets. And um, Chinese banks in coordination with Chinese oil companies have made multi-billion dollar loans to a number of countries in Africa. And they have said that they can pay back those loans in the form of oil and gas over a number of years. Um, also, their um, you know, oil and gas pipelines began being built in record time from Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan to China. Um, also, Russia's East Siberia Pacific Ocean Pipeline started providing oil to China. So again, China reached out to Africa and Russia um, for a lot of its energy um, requirements. But another thing that happened is that um, China started um, basically going um, into the South Sea China um, area and you know, into the waters of South Sea China and drilling into the waters and getting oil from here. Now, um, this was something that started, uh, that that had been going on for a while. Um, and all of a sudden what, what happened is that there was a lot of tension in this area. So um, especially in, you know, it started, I would say in the early 2000s, that the tension started escalating on the waterways of South Sea uh, China. and. A lot of these other countries, for example, said that, look, you can't really necessarily drill into um, the waters over here. Um, they started saying that these waters are shared. Um, as you can see, there's you know, a lot of countries in the neighborhood. There's um, Malaysia, there's Philippines, Vietnam, Taiwan. You know, all of these countries started basically saying and that you know, this is not just China's waters. And, um, very quickly, a lot of Western forces came to the rescue of these countries and agreed uh, with, and said that, you know, um, this isn't fair. And so on South Sea China now, um, there are actually warships, Chinese warships and, you know, Western warships. And um, it's a very dangerous situation on South Sea China. <coughs> um, so... Um, uh, you know, after um, Mr. Uh, Hu Jintao, the next president uh, was Xi Jinping. And um, as soon as he came to power, he basically started um, a whole anti-corruption drive. He established an air defense zone over the South Sea China because, as I mentioned, it was a disputed territory. 
unfortunately, during this time, there was a standoff between Vietnam um, and China and the South Sea China. China um, also signed a $400 billion deal with Russia for gas supplies, because as I mentioned, um, their energy requirement was going up substantially. In 2014, there were protests in Hong Kong at Beijing's plan to vet candidates for elections in 2017. So, you know, Hong Kong, since it had been under the British rule for a long period of time, uh, once they got back and they, you know, became part of China again, um, you know, there have been protests. They, these protests keep erupting every so often. And Mr. Xi, Xi uh, Jinping has, has a close eye on all of that and has helped um, reduce the tensions there. Um, he, um, you know, and during his, his rule, um, you know, this anti-corruption drive has been taken very seriously. And even the chief security, ex-chief security was tried for corruption. It was during his period that Taiwan and China have, hold, have held historic talks, which has been great. And um, also the US has start, started building an artificial reef in South Sea China. And um, Ch the Chinese were not very happy with this because again, the US um, is basically intervening on behalf of others in the region and so China was not necessarily very happy with this situation. So President Xi Jinping is known for um, many big contributions to China. What he's known the most for is the initiation of the One Belt, One Road. In this next section of this lecture today, I'll be talking to you more about the One Belt, One Road initiative. But before I do that, I want to talk to you about China's Silk Road. Now, um, this was initiated um, way back in the Han Dynasty. Um, and the whole idea was that, you know, you can see over here in this picture that a road, a very large extensive road that uh, was made that cut through China. And um, it basically connected the East China all the way to the West. And so, um, especially during the time of the Roman Empire, there was a lot of trade done through the Silk Road. Generally speaking, um, there was a lot of demand globally for Chinese silk. And so a lot of um, silk was exported from China. And in re return, um, the, you know, China received uh, wool, gold, and silver um, from the West. Um, and also during this time, there was a lot of exchange of religions, so Christianity, Buddhism, all of these entered China, again, through the Silk Road. This Silk Road, as I mentioned, is a very long, extensive road. It's 4,000 miles and, or you know, um, uh, 6,400 kilometers um, long. And, um, um, and it's, it's been, you know, widely, it was widely used for trade between the sec, uh, second century BC all the way to the 18th century. And um, it was thanks to the Silk Road that there was a lot of development in the civilizations of China, Korea, Japan, the Indian subcontinent, Iran, Europe, Africa, and uh, Arabia. Because again, um, this road helped import and export. And um, it basically helped improve economic and political relations between various civilizations. This is another, um, you know, just another photo for you to look at of the Silk Road. And you can have a look at just, just to get an idea of how extensive this road was. So this was, you know, um, and this is from 1887. Um, so again, the Silk Road was a big cornerstone um, that really helped increase trade for China. And, you know, it, it was very beneficial. Um, now in 2000, and um, 13, uh, President uh, Xi Jinping basically started, um, it, it came up with the idea of starting a similar initiative um, in the modern day known as the One Belt, One Road Initiative. 
And this is an ambitious economic development and commercial project. And it basically has, again, the similar idea of the old, you know, the original Silk Road, which is that, you know, improving, increasing the connectivity and cooperation amongst uh, multiple countries in different continents of Asia, Africa, and Europe. This OBOR, or One Belt, One Road, is also known as the project of the century by Chinese um, authorities. And according to the grand plan, it would span around and help connect 78 countries around the world. The project involves building a big network of roadways, railways, marine time ports, power grids, oil and gas pipelines, and associated infrastructure projects. There are two parts of the OBOR um, project. The first one is um, the Silk Road Economic Belt, which is basically all land-based. And it's expected to connect China with Central Asia, Eastern Europe, and Western Europe. And the second phase is the 21st century maritime Silk Road, which is sea-based. And um, this will connect China's southern coast to the Mediterranean, Africa, Southeast Asia, and Central Asia. Um, the names are slightly confusing um, because, uh, you know, you, you, this Silk Road, it's called uh, this 21st century Silk, Maritime Silk Road, but actually this is um, the this, this sea-based route. So um, this is the whole idea um, that President uh, Xi Jinping had, and it got initiated, and uh, China also announced that it will invest $1 trillion in various infrastructure projects, <clears throat> and it will um, fund them by offering low-cost loans to participating countries. So um, again, um, a lot of loans would be given to countries um, to help low-cost loans would be, so it's not that China would go and um, just build everything for free. Um, that's not the situation. Um, in fact, China's idea was that they would give loans for countries to help build these infrastructures that would help increase connectivity. And um, if you look at it over here, this is just a view you can see, um, you know, how China would be connected to all these different countries um, and continents around the globe after OBOR is actually implemented. Now, um, OBOR basically has, um, the whole grand plan is to build six um, main magic corridors. Uh, one of them is CPEC, uh, but there are six. And so the first one is the new Eurasian land bridge, which connects Western China to Western Russia. Um, another magic corridor is the China-Mongolia-Russia corridor, which will connect North China to Eastern Russia via Mongolia. Next is the China Central Asia West Asia corridor, which will connect Western China to Turkey via Central and West Asia. Next is the China um, Indochina Peninsula corridor, which will connect Southern China to Singapore via Indochina. Um, next is the CPAC, uh, the China Pakistan corridor, which connects Southern Western so, sorry, southwestern China through Pakistan um, to Arabian Sea routes. And uh, the last one is the Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar corridor, which will connect southern China to India via Bangladesh and Myanmar. And again, um, these are being um, marketed to various countries. Um, and, we, you know, the countries are being told that, look, it's a win win situation for you because. You know, trade will increase. Um, you'll have more. You'll have better connectivity. Um, the loans um, should be will be spent particularly on you know OBOR projects. So all the loans given uh, by China will be um, used to build the connectivity as soon as possible. Um, now um, you know one of the big benefits is that there are still some underdeveloped regions in China. And once the OBOR is built, those underdeveloped uh, regions will also get, you know, there'll be more an increase in economic uh, activity and hopefully they will also benefit. So um, if you really think about, you know, what's in it for China, why are they ready to spend, 
you know, so much money and give all these loans to various countries to build this connectivity. Well, you know, um, first of all, the travel time will go down. Um, so, um, you know, it will just be quicker and easier to get um, export things for China. And, you know, as mentioned earlier, they are the, you know, biggest exporters in the world. And, you know, with all of this connectivity, they'll be able to export yet more. Um, the total transportation cost will go down. And so um, the benefit is that the price of their goods would um, obviously also be reduced because the transportation cost will be less. Also, as I had mentioned earlier, um, there's a lot of tension on South Sea China. And um, in case there is a lot of, you know, for any reason, um, there are skirmishes in that area, um, it would be very difficult for China to um, export via South Sea China and also import. And again, they rely heavily on oil. So having um, other trade routes will basically help them um, navigate this whole situation around the South Sea China a lot better. And it will give them an alternative um, to import and export. Also, again, as I had mentioned, you know, it will be a huge economic boost for the less developed regions of China because a lot of these um, corridors will be um, going through the less developed regions of China. And because of that, um, definitely uh, those regions will, there'll be an increase in trading activity in those regions. Now, um, just to give you an idea, uh, once these, um, you know, one, one belt, one road projects are complete, um, let's have a look at, you know, how much time will be saved, how much cost will be saved. So um, the route, the, the distance between Europe and Western China, will the distance will be reduced by 50%. Um, costs are expected to also be decreased by 50 to 65%. And the time it takes to travel from Western uh, China to Europe will also be reduced by 50%. Next, if, um, if we look at the distance between Middle East and Western China, that will be reduced by 80%. The cost of transportation will be lowered uh, by, you know, over 75%. And, you know, the time for travel, again, will be reduced by 85%. So there are huge benefits in store. Um, again, this is not money that's just being, uh, you know, given away as handouts. This is, um, though the interest rate is low, this money is required to be returned to China at a later date. Um, so with that, I'm going to wrap up the conversation on a war. And now next, we're going to take a deeper look into CPAC um, and have a look at the China-Pakistan corridor. So in this section of the lecture, I will be discussing China-Pakistan Economic Corridor or CPAC with you. Now the whole story of CPAC primarily revolves around a location called Gwadar, which is located in Balochistan. For most of its history, Gwadar was a small to medium sized settlement with an economy largely based on fishing. And it was pretty much when unnoticed. But um, it was in 1954 um, that for the first time the strategic value of Gwadar was um, recognized. And it was identified as an excellent location for building a deep water port uh, by the United States Geological Survey. Um, and um, so what happened is that it was this particular area was under um, Omani rule, uh, the country of Oman um, had, was, it was under Oman's rule, but, um, you know, around um, 2000 or so, um, or in the late 90s, this, this became, you know, it was given back to Pakistan. And in 2001, the construction on the first phase of Gwadar port uh, was initiated um, by General Pervez Musharraf. And in 2007, at a total cost of 248 million, um, you know, this port began being built. And, um, you know, once the port was initially built, 
it was not really utilized for a number of reasons. But then in uh, 2015, uh, Pakistan and China announced their um, intention to develop this port further and um, to build the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. And um, in 2016, this port became operational. Also, what happened is that, you know, around this time, uh, an airport was built in the region, and this was given as, you know, it was, uh, the airport was built as a grant given by the Chinese government to Pakistan. But um, again, everything else, all, you know, all development costs of the port were, have been borne by loans, 0% loans given by China, but um, Pakistan basically has to repay those loans. So a lot of money, a lot of loans were taken and the sport was developed. Um, in the uh, same vicinity, um, in 2016, there was construction of a $2 billion um, special economic zone. And um, the special economic zone is built um, pretty much in line with a special economic zones that were in China. So a lot of work um, was happening in Gwadar. Now, for China, um, this is very beneficial because, again, as I had mentioned, um, South Sea China, there's a lot of tension in that region. And if you also look at it over here, most of the ports are on the eastern side of China. And so goods are transported um, pretty much throughout China to the eastern ports and then ships take them, um, especially if they want to go to, let's say, Europe. It's, it's a rather long um, route uh, that the you know, ships need to take. And so they, if they have to go to Europe, they can go over here. If they have to go to the Middle East, they kind of go over here. But as you can see, you know, it's a rather large uh, trade route uh, for the Asian industrialized nations, right? So, you know, it's, it's, you know, all of these countries, including China, this is the route that they need to take. It's pretty long. Now, um, if and when uh, Gwadar is built, um, and once it was, it, well, it has been built, but um, once, you know, it's fully operationalized and there's more roads and, uh, you know, easily, ac there's more access easily to Gwadar, um, what's going to happen is that China can actually send its goods through its western border and those goods can move through Pakistan and then be shipped um, via Gwadar out to Europe, to, you know, um, Middle East, all the various places. So again, if you can just see, just imagine the amount of transportation cost and time that's being saved. Um, in order for um, this to happen, though, goods will need to go through the western side of China. Now, the western side of China, um, there's a whole area called Xinjiang, and this is 50% Muslim population, and this area is actually not very well developed. And um, Xinjiang borders on Russia, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that China feels will be very beneficial is that this region will also um, get more developed uh, once goods start being transferred um, through the Western, um, but through Western China. So um, there are a lot of uh, developmental projects uh, that, you know, it's through CPAC. Um, and so, you know, the, the worth of the development projects that is expected, um, you know, again, to sort of facilitate Gwadar and sending goods through Gwadar, um, the worth of those development projects are 62 billion and there are a lot of um, roads and highways that are being built from Gwadar to Kunj, uh, Kunjrab. There's a motorway being built from uh, Karachi to Lahore, an expressway through Muzaffarabad, uh, from Muzaffarabad to Mirpur. And um, there's also going to be freight trains to transport goods from Gwadar to Kunjrab. Kunj, uh, um, <clears throat> the CPEC investment portfolio initially um, it was 46 billion. Later on, it was increased to um, 62. But of the original 46 billion, it was expected that um, you know 34 billion would be um, would go into building of you know energy, electricity, 
um, basically along those lines. Roads would be built for $6 billion, railways for $4 billion, Gwadar Port, there would be, you know, 790 3 million cent over there and there would be a lot of you know fiber optic um cables um that would go through the country and that would help um, you know usage of the internet and 44 uh, million dollars would be spent on that so that was the general initial general breakup but as i mentioned um you know this this amount was increased um the fiber optic cable is expected to sort of go through the entire <clears throat> you know, a big portion of the entire country. And again, you know, especially through the trade routes, because again, when goods are being sent through Pakistan uh, by, you know, uh, companies, they want to make sure, logistics companies want to make sure that they can track where the goods are on the route. And so connectivity is essential. So um, overall, you know, there's, there is uh, this 46 billion uh, Chinese, it's, you know, it's, it's a confusing term of investment because again, these, I do want to repeat that these are loans that have been given. Um, you know, this, however, is expected to increase the GDP potential. So, you know, it's through, all, you know, all of these, once you build roads, once you build this connectivity, all of this, um, and good, good start flowing through Pakistan, um, you know, there will be, you know, taxes and there will be other benefits uh, for all those people, all the, for example, truckers that have to go through Pakistan will be stopping at various places. And it's expected that overall there will be a boost in GDP and there'll be an incremental private sector investment as well. So other companies will also be looking at Pakistan a little differently since it's going to have, a, there'll be a lot more import export going through the country. So it's expected that there'll be more private sector investment. Um, and it's also expected that just through uh, CPAC, they'll, you know, the GDP growth rate will increase and um, hopefully it will increase, you know, above six to 7%, which is, which is a good amount. So, um, you know, again, CPAC for Pakistan, what are the benefits for Pakistan? We definitely have seen that it benefits uh, China in a big way. Um, so quite a few uh, benefits, you know, more local and foreign investment. Um, you know, if there's a lot of activity happening, trade activity happening, um, it, it will be a pull for foreign and local investment, more developmental opportunities. So obviously the countries um, that will be sending their goods uh, through Pakistan, there may be opportunities for um, businesses along the way to um, facilitate the trade. Industrial expansion and employment opportunities and prospects in areas such as power, construction, dry port, um, industrial parks, economic zones. So again, with all of this construction activity, there's going to be more um, labor involved. It will be uh, <clears throat> help all, um, you know, the construction industry in a big way. And so um, definitely there's more economic activity through the building of CPAC. The concerns that people have um, regarding CPAC is that, you know, perhaps, you know, no people are going to be used in the actual port um, to do work. Um, so this is something that is, you know, concerns people that, you know, a lot of the work that's being done in CPAC is being done by the Chinese directly. And so there's not a lot of transfer of technology. And also that um, one of the biggest concerns regarding CPAC is that all of this money that has come in is by virtue of loans. And, um, you know, some of it is on 0% interest. Um, the one, for example, the investment that's been made in Gwadar Port. But um, others, you know, there are, there are some interest rates involved. And so the question is, how will Pakistan pay this money back? Um, will it be able to pay the money back? And if it doesn't, then what repercussions will, will there be? So um, these are some concerns. Um, overall, uh, you know, Pakistan is moving steadfast ahead. China is moving ahead with CPAC. And it is considered to be a game changer in the area. It's also uh, um, very much in line with OBOR and um, the overall, um, you know, fulfilling the overall vision of uh, President uh, of the president, Xi Jinping. One thing I do want to mention that of the six economic corridors, CPAC is the first one um, that has actually materialized. 
all the other corridors, um, they are in the negotiation phase. None of the other corridors have been started. Um, there has been no work done on them. A lot of the other countries are, have, are a bit reluctant to um, take on um, such huge loans and um, they have their own reasons. Um, but um, you know, again, Pakistan for strategic reasons uh, felt that this was good for them as well. And so that's why they went ahead and they have built um, CPAC. Um, with that, I've come to an end to this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it, you learned a lot from it, and I look forward to an interesting discussion with you soon. Thank you. So in this section of the lecture, I will be discussing China-Pakistan Economic Corridor or CPAC with you. Now, the whole story of CPAC primarily revolves around a location called Gwadar, which is located in Balochistan. For most of its history, Gwadar was a small to medium-sized settlement with an economy largely based on fishing. And it was pretty much went unnoticed. But um, it was in 1954 um, that for the first time, the strategic value of Gwadar was um, recognized. And it was identified as an excellent location for building a deep water port uh, by the United States Geological Survey. Um, and um, so what happened is that it was, this particular area was under um, Omani rule. Uh, the country of Oman um, had, was, it was under Oman's rule. But, um, you know, around um, 2000 or so, um, or in the late 90s, this, this became, you know, it was given back to Pakistan. And in 2001, the construction on the first phase of Gwadar port uh, was initiated um, by General Pervez Musharraf. And in 2007, at a total cost of 248 million, um, you know, this port began being built. And, um, you know, once the port was initially built, it was not really utilized for a number of reasons. But then in uh, 2015, uh, Pakistan and China announced their um, intention to develop this port further and um, to build the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. And um, in 2016, this port became operational. Also, what happened is that, you know, around this time, uh, an airport was built in the region, and this was given as, you know, it was, uh, the airport was built as a grant given by the Chinese government to Pakistan. But um, again, everything else, all, you know, all development costs of the port were, have been borne by loans, 0% loans given by China, but uh, Pakistan basically has to repay those loans. So a lot of money, a lot of loans were taken and the sport was developed. Um, in the uh, same vicinity, um, in 2016, there was construction of a $2 billion um, special economic zone. And um, the special economic zone is built um, pretty much in line with uh, special economic zones that were in China. So a lot of work um, was happening in Gwadar. Now, for China, um, this is very beneficial because, again, as I had mentioned, um, South Sea China, there's a lot of tension in that region. And if you also look at it over here, for it, most of the ports are on the eastern side of China. And so goods are transported um, pretty much throughout China to the eastern ports. And then ships take them, um, especially if they want to go to, let's say, Europe. It's a, it's a rather long um, route uh, that the you know ships need to take and so they if they have to go to Europe they can go over here if they have to go to the Middle East they kind of go over here but as you can see you know it's a rather large uh, trade route uh, for the Asian industrialized nations right so you know it's it's you know all of these countries including China this is the route that they need to take it's pretty long now um, if and when uh, Gwadar is built um, and once it was, it, well, it has been built, but um, once, you know, it's fully operationalized and there's more roads and, uh, you know, 
easily, there's more access easily to water. Um, what's going to happen is that China can actually send its goods through its western border and those goods can move through Pakistan and then be shipped um, via Gwadar out to Europe, to, you know, um, Middle East, all the various places. So again, if you can just see, just imagine the amount of transportation cost and time that's being saved. Um, in order for um, this to happen though, goods will need to go through the Western side of China. Now, the Western side of China, um, there's a whole area called Xinjiang, and this is 50% Muslim population, and this area is actually not very well developed. And um, Xinjiang borders on Russia, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that China feels will be very beneficial is that this region will also um, get more developed uh, once goods start being transferred um, through the Western, um, but through Western China. So um, there are a lot of uh, developmental projects uh, that, you know, it's through CPAC. Um, and so, you know, the, the worth of the development projects that is expected, um, you know, again, to sort of facilitate Gwadar and sending goods through Gwadar, um, the worth of those development projects are 62 billion and there are a lot of um, roads and highways that are being built from Gwadar to Kunj, uh, Kunjrab. There's a motorway being built from uh, Karachi to Lahore an expressway through Muzaffarabad, uh, from Muzaffarabad to Mirpur. And um, there's also going to be freight trains to transport goods from Gwadar to Kunj, Kunj uh, Rab. Um, <clears throat> the CPEC investment portfolio, initially um, it was 46 billion, later on it was increased to um, 62, but of the original 46 billion, it was expected that, um, you know, 34 billion would be um, would go into building of you know energy electricity um, basically along those lines roads would be built for six billion dollars railways for four billion dollars Gwadar port there would be you know seven hundred ninety three million cent over there and there would be a lot of you know fiber optic um, cables um, that would go through the country and that would help um, you know usage of the internet and $44 uh, million would be spent on that. So that was the general, initial general breakup, but as I mentioned, um, you know, this, this amount was increased. Um, the fiber optic cable is expected to sort of go through the entire, <clears throat> you know, a big portion of the entire country. And again, you know, especially through the trade routes, because again, when goods are being sent through Pakistan uh, by, you know, uh, companies, they want to make sure, logistics companies want to make sure that they can track where the goods are on the route. And so connectivity is essential. So um, overall, you know, there is there is uh, this 46 billion uh, Chinese, it's, you know, it's, it's a confusing term of investment because again, these, I do want to repeat that these are loans that have been given, um, you know, this, however, is expected to increase the GDP potential. So, you know, it's through, all, you know, all of these, once you build roads, once you build this connectivity, all of this, um, and good, goods start flowing through Pakistan, um, you know, there will be, you know, taxes and there will be other benefits uh, for all those people, all the, for example, truckers that have to go through Pakistan will be stopping at various places. And it's expected that overall there will be a boost in GDP and there'll be an incremental private sector investment as well. So other companies will also be looking at Pakistan a little differently since it's going to have, a, there'll be a lot more import export going through the country. So it's expected that there'll be more private sector investment. Um, and it's also expected that just through uh, CPAC, they'll, you know, the GDP growth rate will increase and um, hopefully it will increase, you know, above six to 7%, which is, which is a good amount. So, um, you know, again, CPAC for Pakistan, what are the benefits for Pakistan? We definitely have seen that it benefits uh, China in a big way. Um, so 
quite a few uh, benefits, you know, more local and foreign investment. Um, you know, if there's a lot of activity happening, trade activity happening, um, it, it will be a pull for foreign and local investment, more developmental opportunities. So obviously the countries um, that will be sending their goods uh, through Pakistan, there may be opportunities for um, businesses along the way to um, facilitate the trade. Industrial expansion and employment opportunities and prospects in areas such as power, construction, dry port, um, industrial parks, economic zones. So again, with all of this construction activity, there's going to be more um, labor involved. It will be uh, <clears throat> help all, uh, you know, the construction industry in a big way. And so um, definitely there's more economic activity through the building of CPAC. The concerns that people have um, regarding CPAC is that, you know, perhaps, you know, no people are going to be used in the actual port um, to do work. Um, so this is something that is, you know, concerns people that, you know, a lot of the work that's being done in CPAC is being done by the Chinese directly. And so there's not a lot of transfer of technology. And also that um, one of the biggest concerns regarding CPAC is that all of this money that has come in is by virtue of loans. And um, you know, some of it is on 0% interest. Um, the one, for example, the investment that's been made in Gwadar Port, but um, others, you know, there are there are some interest rates involved. And so the question is how will Pakistan pay this money back? Um, will it be able to pay the money back? And if it doesn't, then what repercussions will, will there be? So um, these are some concerns. Um, overall, uh, you know, Pakistan is moving steadfast ahead. China is moving ahead with CPAC, and it is considered to be a game changer in the area. It's also um, very much in line with OBOR and um, the overall, um, you know, fulfilling the overall vision of uh, President uh, of the President Xi Jinping. One thing I do want to mention that of the six economic corridors, CPAC is the first one um, that has actually materialized. All the other corridors, um, they are in the negotiation phase. None of the other corridors have been started. Um, there has been no work done on them. A lot of the other countries are, have, are a bit reluctant to um, take on um, such huge loans and um, they have their own reasons. Um, but, um, you know, again, Pakistan, for strategic reasons, uh, felt that this was good for them as well. And so that's why they went ahead and they have built um, CPAC. Um, with that, I've come to an end to this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. You learned a lot from it. And I look forward to an interesting discussion with you soon. Thank you.